right now, there's a report that came out last fall. Air pollution emissions from mowing lawns. It's equivalent to having another 3.6 million cars on the road. We have chronic air pollution and ozone problems. So the way that we manage those sites that you work on impacts communities, both human and wild predators. We know that the lack of nature in a community can increase your chances of having mental illness by three times, or feelings of loneliness by multiple times. So sometimes we hear people say, we can't get more nature, more park space, more green space to a community that's facing housing insecurity or food insecurity or other things. And it's just the reverse. Nature is protective. If you lose your car because there's not enough nature in your neighborhood to avoid the floods, where is your housing, food, and other security go? So we have to solve these all together. And that's why I think one home is a note of hope. There are different ways of doing things. And it's also a very ancient system, guided by modern technology. Every single one of your ancestors at one point believed in one home. It's recapturing that and aligning it with modern tools to get us that place. So if we did that, if we actually designed and built, planned, did policy, and funded things through a one health lens, we wouldn't just be planning for these people. We'd be planning for all of nature. So one health embraces any connections between people, plants, animals, and their shared environment. And this originally came out of zoonotic diseases like COVID. But the original one health really looked at what could hurt you in nature. And there's certainly environmental hazards like hurricanes and zoonotic diseases and that kind of thing. What we're really focusing on here is where are the deficits in one health in terms of uplifting communities with the power of nature-based solutions, the power of nature. So we're taking a smaller frame and saying there are many actions we can take through park space, through the deployment of one, one health interventions with nature to uplift everyone. And like I said, this is a community I work in a lot of um, often. One Health is not just a framing, it's not just an idea. If you apply it in these different areas, including action on the ground, which is happening all across the city, you can do wonderful things for community, you can decrease inequities, and you can also attend to this. Houston, unbeknownst to most people, is only one of two biodiversity hotspot cities in the United States. What that means is that it's a place of exceptional biodiversity. Not okay, exceptional, world class. But it too is under threat by many of the forces that are putting our human communities under threat. Climate change, inequity, environmental degradation. It impacts the humans and the wildlife, often in the same community, simultaneously. So let's have some collective uh, decision making and action. That's what I'm going to bring up here in one. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, what we're looking at when we talk about One Health and the framework is the three different receptors being humans, wildlife, and the biodiversity associated with it, as well as the environment that they're shared. Um, that they're shared. So these three receptors, when we're looking at a One Health framework, all have a seat at the table. And as we will discover during our exercise that we're going to do, um, led by Isabel and Andrew later, um, design elements in our urban core can be layered on to build additive co-benefits. So we see the intersection between humans and wildlife, and that's where we're looking at disease control, spirituality, mental health, things like that. And then the outcomes then can become synergistic kind of augmented over time and augmented over space and in, in broader areas, especially when you start looking at uh, corridors and really bringing the wildlife and, um, and a healthy environment into um, the urban core along with the humans. Um, that's right. um, but we're faced with those fundamental challenges like we talked about um, earlier, Teresa and um, team at uh, Houston Land Bank, what Jaime was just talking about with heat, with flooding, we're faced with these fundamental challenges that we know are 
disproportionately affecting different communities. And the redlining, the structural racism, has filtered into what we have on the ground in terms of landscape heterogeneity. But at the same time, what we can do is look at a One Health framework and One Health principles and start then drilling down and kind of helping to remedy some of those fundamental disproportionate um, um, classism and racism. So it's, it's a powerful tool in that sense. Um, so we can start building um, uh, this equitable access um, to resiliency and adaptive capacities within our communities. Um, when we're looking at sort of a, just an ex example of stormwater management and flood resilience, what we've always ta talked about in terms of a functional pyramid is building um, from the basics of engineering. We um, uh, build on those fundamental principles of hydrology, hydraulics, we achieve even more if we look at the geomorphology of the systems, allowing the streets to meander, allowing the bed form to form, and having pools and ripples for fisheries and everything. We add on um, the, the vegetation in a riparian corridor, then we can start building out greenways and those connect and those connections from park hotspots to other park hotspots and allowing the wildlife to coexist with humans in that landscape. And ultimately, it becomes an equity issue. It becomes where can we actually build on these fundamental gray infrastructure to, to build on uh, the uh, One Health perspective. Um, looking again um, at, the, at the framework in terms of functionality from the different percept, uh, receptors perspective, we have at the center of the uh, this circle the wildlife habitat and all of the things that we're bringing to the table for them. But we add on the, in the second circle the environmental concerns and building water quality, building air quality, doing the temperature regulation for shade and for um, uh, carbon sequestration. And then at the end of the day, at the outer circle, those human resources, those human um, benefits that are coming to the table. Um, so then if we look at, for example, adding a riparian corridor, adding a riparian vegetation to our uh, flood conveyance channels along with the greenways, we can start building those connections between the receptors and, and additive uh, benefits for all. And then, you know, beyond just those that are outlined here, you know, we'll have physical health and economic opportunity as people are able to move through our urban core in a, in a healthy and pleasing way. So that's um, sort of overall where we're taking uh, One Health in terms of the framework, and now we're going to talk a bit more about our index that we've been doing. Great, well thank you Carolyn. For the past year our team's been working to build on this framework and think through, you know, how do we measure One Health across Harris County and put together a way, uh, a screening tool to think about how do we align efforts, inform our projects, and get a you know, high level glimpse of what One Health looks like. What are the outcomes in our community? So this has been the critical question we've tried to answer throughout uh, the last year is how do we measure One Health? And so conceptualizing this, we touched on these themes here of uh, human health and well-being, biodiversity and animal health, and then environmental health, uh, plant health is but one way to put it. And so we thought about you know, how do we bring all these different data sets, all these different lenses together in this project. And what we've worked through the past year has been really curating you know, locally relevant data sets that are out there, kind of understand what's available through you know, federal, state, or local agencies. Um, so think about you know, the CDC, NASA, USGS, there's a whole wealth of data out there, but it's different web tools, different web apps, maybe different spreadsheets hiding somewhere. Uh, we know that there are local research institutions that are creating data and putting that in service of the community. Um, but there are also crowdsourced tools that also allow us to get some better glimpses of what's happening on the ground. So you know, again, looking at sort of these different factors here, human health, these person environmental related factors, um, ways to look at animal and environmental health. You'll learn as we kind of go through these that there are a lot of ways to 
you need, as you know, we've talked about, all these data sets are interrelated. So one of the hardest parts is figuring out which bucket do we put it in, especially when we're talking about red herring corridors that you know, have you know, significant impacts. Um, you know, how do we measure you know, the flora quality in there, but also um, you know, flood risk as well and how that impacts human health. So we'll spend a couple of moments going through the types of data that are out there. And on your data cards, the little laminated cards you should have received when you walked in, um, those will all have examples of a data set that you've incorporated in the index. Um, so I'll quickly start with hum human health, and then we'll have Ryan up here to talk a little bit more about some of the environmental and animal health. Um, but you know, really approach this by looking at sort of key socioeconomic and person-related factors that are out there. And, and when we work with health data, human health data in particular, this is something that is you know, fairly easy to observe. We have, especially in Houston and Harris County, a pretty massive you know, medical uh, you know, program going on here. And these are things that we can observe through people. They can be reported. You know, there are surveys and other statistical tools that are used to help measure health outcomes. So CDC places data, you know, has track level reporting, which is essentially a little bit larger than they were focused on, you know, incidents of gross prevalence of residents in this census tract with, with cancer uh, that are having 14 or more days a month of poor physical health, uh, have as one of these other outcomes. So we can get a snapshot of this point in time of how our community is doing and their health outcomes. <laughs> Uh, we can also use tools like a social vulnerability index, again, to help assess uh, those person-related factors. But this being a conversation also about nature-based solutions, you know, the environmental factors here are really important tying this all together. So you know, how do we also adopt tools such as the heat vulnerability index and air quality vulnerability that we put together by Harris County Health? Um, you know, how do we adapt you know, FEMA flood risk maps? How many people live within, you know, uh, a floodway, a 1% floodplain, a 0.2% 500 year floodplain. Um, you know, because when your house is flood, you have all sorts of indoor air quality issues, you have your displaced, that is a huge stressor. And so, you know, we also want to think about how these pieces all fit together. I'll pass off to Ryan a little bit more for some of the environmental data. Traffic jam up here. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, Anthony. So, uh, as my colleagues up here have pointed out today, right, this is really a systems scale question. So along with the human components, we're also breaking this down over a couple of other categories. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the environmental health. Um, a lot of these metrics, different types of data that you see up here, are really some of the fundamental pieces that went into formalizing and shaping the current One Health Index that we're going to get into a little bit longer um, down in the presentation here as well. But one of the things that we can do to try to start solving these issues is look and see what's currently out there. What is available? What do we have access to? What can we leverage that's already on the table, that way we can get a good understanding of where we are, um, and even a better picture of where we're going in the future, right? So some of those examples of what we're able to pull together and utilize through this process um, is things like the National Land Cover Database. Uh, so that has a number of different uh, data layers within that, uh, a lot of the describing land use and, and um, land surface areas and things like that too. But we're able to take some of that raw data that describes different habitat types and you know how diverse the ecosystems are, especially within Harris County, uh, to get a better understanding of what that looks like um, on the, the kind of societal scale and the community scale as well. So uh, looking at the diversity and types of open spaces that are present, uh, how much open space is present versus how little. Where is that open space occurring and where it's not occurring, right? So these kind of fundamental questions um, is what we can start to get at um, utilizing some of these data sources. Uh, another big one too that really is a fundamental driver when it comes to all of these different environmental, social, and human health issues is the impervious surfaces present, right? So how much concrete do we have in those areas? How much heat is that concrete holding onto and emitting overnight to increase the overall temperatures? Uh, within these spaces as well. So that is something with the impervious surfaces, of course, uh, that can also uh, be related to stormwater management and flood impacts and things like that. Uh, but really, we have some good data that can help us to understand what that currently looks like uh, when it comes to some of those land use, land cover type characteristics. Uh, so on top of that, I'm gonna talk about this first, but uh, we also want to kind of characterize and assess our current uh, green spaces so that when it comes to acreage of protected areas with like the PADAS um, data set that's available for USGS, right? So uh, what do our conserved areas look like? Uh, where is that parkland occurring? Where are large conservation properties occurring within this system? 
uh, all which have tremendous amount of relations and impacts to these other factors that we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, on top of that, you know, within Harris County, we have kind of, if you break it up loosely, three different types of habitats primarily. Uh, so we have the wetlands, we have our forested systems, we have our coastal prairies. Uh, but wetlands is something that really occurs across of all three of those different habitat types. So looking at the National Wetlands Inventory, uh, that's something else that we factored into this process as well to get an understanding of, you know, where are those wetlands occurring because they do play such a strong role and have such a significance um, no matter the ecosystem or habitat that you're specifically focused on there as well. Uh, another major one is coming from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Uh, which is their ecological mapping systems of Texas. Uh, this is actually a statewide database. Uh, there's a little bit over 400 or so different habitat or vegetation classifications within this, right? So uh, what do those plant assemblages look like? How can we factor that into the conversation when it comes to ecology uh, and understanding what species are present or may be present uh, in these different parts of the county and how that all ties into these other factors that we're talking about here with uh, habitats or open space or parkland and things like that there as well. Uh, and then the last one I was going to touch on for this slide here uh, is focused on the tree canopy too, right? So part of this process and, and one of the reasons why we developed this index is to get a good understanding of what is currently available, what is out there, and how to utilize it. But at the same time, we're also considering gaps. Where is that information needed? What information or what do we need to fill that gaps uh, to give us the information and, and gain knowledge to go off of to help continue to evolve this process um, in the future as well. So I can speak a little bit coming from a sciences background here too. That's really one of our core missions, right? So how can we create that new information? What tools do we have available? Um, and one of the ways that we're currently doing that is utilizing LIDAR uh, as advanced technology to really give us a much deeper impression of what is occurring in these different types of uh, systems across, uh, you know, whether it's a county or, or a local scale as well. Uh, so with the LIDAR, we can actually begin to really peer within the tree canopy, right? So it's not about whether there is or there is not tree canopy in an area. Uh, we can actually start to look at the profile of that tree canopy. You know, how does that relate in a three-dimensional uh, perspective to these other factors that we're talking about when it comes to everything we've hit on in, on the environmental issues, heat, uh, flooding, and all of those kind of interrelated factors as well. Uh, so that's another piece that we're continuing to uh, pursue uh, to add kind of, uh, some more information or really complete uh, the puzzle when it comes to building that bigger perspective um, and getting more granular to uh, some of the information that we have access to. Uh, so the other major component we've touched on human health, environmental health, uh, but also animal health. Uh, that's really a, a main driver of kind of the One Health um, perspective here too, right, is that um, you really can't have one without the other, as Hamid had pointed out as well. So um, we want to look at some measures of quality or diversity um, here too, and a few of the different ways that we actually did that uh, as part of the One Health process is to again utilize the ecological mapping systems of Texas, um, which really gets at a lot of the plant life present, uh, the types of characteristics uh, present within those different habitats that may support uh, different types of, of animals and, and wildlife and things like that as well. Um, another major factor there in terms of habitat quality, right, uh, whether or not the habitat is even suitable to support wildlife is looking at the water quality um, aspects. What is the characterization of the water resources present in that area? How many wildlife are utilizing that, that, those water resources? Uh, and what might the quality be then uh, for the health of the animals uh, present on site as well? So that was uh, taken into consideration, uh, looking at impaired stream segments um, and a lot of our different values throughout Harris County. Um, there are some various issues there with the water quality, um, but really trying to draw the connection between the health of the system uh, and the water resources, and then also the, the animals that can utilize those spaces. Uh, another big one then in terms of this animal health um, is looking at um, or utilizing by naturalist observations too. So um, we have Jaime Gonzalez here, uh, today has actually touched on uh, earlier this morning too about how our naturalists can really be a tool um, in some of these spaces where there's not a lot of this data available to help uh, gain a perspective on what animals might be present uh, for that regard as well and give us um, something to look at when it comes to trying to establish biodiversity in these different um, spaces as well. So that was something that was factored in and pulled into the index too. 
Uh, and then lastly, in terms of animal health, um, really focused on the connectivity aspects of that. Uh, so there is some data out there um, from uh, SECAS, which is the blueprint um, connections and habitat priority areas as well. Um, so kind of coming back to you know green infrastructure as a concept and the idea of having wildlife corridors connected to conservation hubs, uh, all of which you know typically span our riparian areas and, and really help to uh, the interconnectedness of the system uh, with the wildlife usage and, and uh, travel and things like that too, uh, which factors into the riparian corridors. Uh, but even things like utility corridors and easements, right? So our power lines, um, those are also spaces that can be utilized to support um, wildlife and animals. Uh, oftentimes, we've seen some fantastic examples of uh, utility providers being willing to uh, create some habitat space uh, in the power line easement, um, where we have maybe trees removed before it can become a coastal prairie uh, with native wildflowers and pollinator uh, friendly species that also promote uh, and support uh, animal health as well. So those are some of the factors that we looked at uh, when it comes to the environmental and animal health. And then I'll pass it back off to Andrew there to talk more about the index. All right, so after we got to build on the knowledge of this team and their expertise, and again, how do we pull these data sets together? How do we make sense of this? Our team had a very fun task of how do we generalize this across all of Harris County in very diverse neighborhoods and uh, a pretty expansive geography to be working with. Um, so, of these 31 variables, we uh, developed a method to generalize them across what the Kinder Institute uses to generalize their survey reporting. Um, their community tabulation areas, basically groupings of census tracts that roughly resemble our neighborhoods. So, they, they don't match up perfectly, so take sort of the exact boundaries with grain of salt, but it does provide us with a way to help moralize these outputs too. So, you know, acres as a percentage of the overall area. You know, how do we think about you know downtown versus you know Clear Lake, for example? Um, you know, how to compare these different diverse geographies. So the overall index we put together looked at about 31 variables, as you can see, about 16 focused on human health, those pink ones up there, eight or so focused on those uh, environmental health, and about seven on the animal health side. And what I'll say is that. You know, this also reflects a little bit, little bit of the data availability, what's currently out there, what can we use, and I think raise a lot of great questions for what our next steps are in this process too. And one thing I just want to emphasize is that you know, this is really a screening tool, it's not a this is how things are, this is exactly what is happening on the ground, and what the outcome looks like in your community, and as well will mention in a bit how the outcomes vary quite a bit by depending on where you are in Harris County and the types of indicators that pop out here. So, um, we, we hope to have some more information on that, but just keep in mind this is a screening tool and this is sort of a, a starting point to you know, work with communities and work with local, local knowledge and information. Okay, so what does this actually look like and how do we start figuring out what um, communities have what priorities? So I'll talk a little bit now about the, some of the results that we saw. So what you're looking at here is five different communities, and you're seeing the 31 different um, data sets um, kind of across this each row. And then we've, you know, it's color coded by the human health and well-being in the pink, the environmental health in the green, and then the biodiversity and animal health in the blue. And then in that far corner, um, the, this is the raw one health score. So you can start to see here that the darker colors are indicating priority um, in that data set and the lighter is not necessarily a priority. Um, so if you start to compare, these are all lined up with the same data sets, but what you can really see here is that um, Harris County communities have different One Health priorities. Um, if you're looking at the human health and well-being in the first category for preconditioned data, you're seeing um, priority communities such as Casimir Gardens, Langwood, and Pleasantville show up. If you're looking at it from the environmental um, conditions for human health, you're seeing communities like Westwood or South Houston or Pleasantville um, show up as well. Um, in the environmental health category, the two communities that are kind of standing out here, um, from the system scale, um, you're seeing Westwood has lots of priorities there, um, whereas in South Houston, there's um, a lot of priority in the site scale. In the <coughs> biodiversity and animal health, you're seeing the diversity category light up in all of the five communities. 
Um, and then, then in the kind of quality area, you're seeing cashmere gardens light up. Um, and then for the uh, connectivity um, data set, you're seeing a lot of priority in Pleasantville. So the key takeaway here is kind of, even though these scores are fairly close to one another, 23, 22, 19, 21, um, there's very different um, priorities um, in these communities. So we're going to take a closer look at Westwood. So in the One Health Index here, um, you're seeing 11 priority areas in the human health and well-being. And so um, some of the priorities in this data set included the high incidence of poor mental health, high social <coughs> vulnerability, high heat vulnerability, low heart acreage, and 96% um, of residents um, reside in a flood zone. Um, for environmental health, um, there are seven priority areas, 83% impervious cover in this community, and only a 9% canopy cover. And then in the biodiversity and animal health category, there are four priority areas. Some of this um, includes a low number of unique species reported on iNaturalist, and a high mean distance to um, conservation and repairing corridors. So with that, I think we're going to jump into our exercise. And the first piece here is to pull out your data card. Um, and I'll give you a second to kind of go over it. But um, we're looking at this side of the card. And what we've done is we've taken Westwood's um, different data sets and started to categorize them for you. So you have one data set in particular. So you'll have the category um, on, listed at the very top. Um, you'll have a data category, um, so like a subcategory, and then you'll have your data set name. We've also provided some, a definition about the data set and then how that might play out kind of at a personal level for the Westwood community. Um, so we'll give you a second to go over those. But the idea here is that this will be your client for the remainder of the um, exercise.